Sandy. I'm the president here of the Free Inquiry Group. So here we are, a secular group of humanists um, dedicated to improving the human condition through rational inquiry and creative thought, unfettered by superstition, religion, or dogma. Um, and I did want to say a few things, too, that we do have uh, membership. So if you do go to our website, gofigure.org or freeinquirygroup.org, um, you can sign up for our email updates, um, as well as if you wanted to start a membership that's $30 um, that helps support the work that we do. You can also help support us um, through the Kroger program. You can sign up your Kroger points. Um, as well as Amazon Smile that can also help uh, with the work that we do. So um, this, or I guess it was the other day, I did find a little cicada shell. Aww. Um, so I do have, have a little friend, he's opened up. So he did, he did escape or she, and either way, and, and took off into the trees. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thanks, Mandy. Well, um, Dan was showing us a lot of cicadas there. And uh, there's that, that one was Dan. <laughs> Stop! So, for those of you who've uh, already been with us for a few minutes, you've been hearing uh, Dr. Gene Kritsky talk a little bit. Uh, he reminded us that uh, Fig has a warm spot in his heart from early days at Camp Quest. Uh, Gene's a North Dakota native. He's the Dean of Behavioral and Natural Sciences and Professor in the Department of Biology uh, at Mount St. Joseph University in Cincinnati and Editor of American Entomologist. He's authored or edited 10 books and over 250 papers and I looked through all of them and they seem to never end on subjects as diverse as entomology, Egyptology, ancient and medieval agriculture, evolution, history of science, dinosaur biology, insect poetry, and insect mythology. One of his best known books, and I may have left a few out there, Gene, sorry. One of his best known books, The Tears of, do I pronounce it Re or Ru or what? Hey, Ray. Ray, uh, colon, Beekeeping in Ancient Egypt was published by Oxford University Press. His most recent book, Periodical Cicadas, the Brood 10 edition, is published this year. Krisky received his BA in biology from Indiana University in 1974 and his MS and PhD in entomology from the University of Illinois, 1976 and 77 respectively. He received a Fulbright scholarship in 1981-82 to teach at Minya University in Upper Egypt. He joined the faculty at Mount St. Joseph University, which was then a college in 1983. He lives with his wife, the artist Jesse Smith, right here in Cincinnati, Ohio. He also was treasurer of the Philocicada Society, Philocicada Society, which existed at some point in the 1990s. Greater Cincinnati and Mount St. Joseph University are most fortunate to have him, as are we here at FIG, to have him for this May's monthly presentation. Please welcome Dr. Jean Christie. Kritsky. Sorry, Jean. That's all right. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate the uh, intro. And am I able to share the, can you share the screen with me? Yes, we can allow that. Peter, Peter, on your, are you on that? Listen, listen, yes. Uh, Doc, I can uh, handle this. Let me see, I, I've given you, can one participant share at a time? Yes, you can share. It says, uh, I still don't have it yet. You got it now. I got, I got it now, thank you. Yep. Well, it's a, a pleasure to be here. I'm going to, uh, uh, I know what you're all thinking. He's a college professor. It's going to be 50 minutes. It'll be a quiz. <laughs> uh, it won't be that bad, uh, but uh, I'm going to uh, uh, make you all cicada specialists so that going into what's happening now and in the next week, uh, you can uh, 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 impress your friends with your cicada knowledge and uh, uh, something you'll be able to remember at least until 20. Uh, 38 when they come out again, although we will have group 14 in just four years. So uh, let's uh, start from the beginning. <clears throat> periodical cicadas. What are periodical cicadas? These are insects that belong to the uh, uh, insect order Hemiptera, which includes things, uh, some things that you may or may not know. Hopefully you don't know about all of them, 
as stink bugs here in the corner and the other end is bed bugs on the other side, but also aphids. Aphids are more closely related to the cicadas than our bed bugs and stink bugs. They have piercing sucking mouth parts, which is what unites the entire order. The, um, Ava. Yeah, let's ask everyone to mute. So uh, uh, within the family, within the hemiptera, there's the family cicadidae, which includes, uh, which is in, within the family cicadioidea, which includes two families, the hairy cicadas, which are smaller, look very much like cicadas, but with a lot of pubescence, and the true cicadas, the family cicadidae. The, uh, uh, one of the questions I've asked almost every week now is, don't we get cicadas every year? And the answer is yes, we do. We have in Ohio, uh, 20 species of cicadas, six species of periodical cicadas, and there are 12 species of annual cicadas, but two of them each have a extra subspecies to give us our, our 20 forms. The annual cicadas that you see here on the left uh, are larger than the periodical cicadas. These slides are not to scale to one another. They have green or black eyes. The annual cicadas are mostly green, brown, and black. They've got this, the face is almost straight line between the eyes. A little bunch there, but not much. They tend to emerge in uh, starting in early July, <clears throat> and they'll continue emerging into September. And, and uh, you'll hear them up through October, into October, excuse me. They're the ones that we hear in the fall going bzz, 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 bzz. They come out in small numbers. So when you try to find it, when you hear that call, you look up in the trees and you don't see them because they're backlit, they're also camo colored. Uh, they'll be gone by the uh, middle to the end of October. Periodical cicadas, on the other hand, they emerge in May and June. And uh, unlike the, uh, the annual cicadas, they've got a, uh, they have red eyes, black bodies, and a little bit of a bulge here at the clipius or the front of the head. Uh, they have wings that are, have veins uh, colored in orange. There is one large species and two small species. These guys, as I mentioned, just emerge in May and June. And when they emerge, they emerge in large numbers. I mean, unlike the annual cicadas where you have to look hard to find them, you don't have to look hard to find a periodical cicada. If you've got them, you're going to know it because they're going to be all over your, your trees, your uh, the walls your house, of your houses, fences, and so on. Unlike the annual cicadas, which come out in small numbers, periodical cicadas come out in big numbers to overwhelm their predators, to satiate their predators, giving them all the cicadas they can eat, and there are still millions left to go. And so uh, uh, very different. May, June, large numbers, July through October, small numbers, those separate the two. The colors are separate. Uh, and for annual cicadas, we do not know how many years ago their eggs were laid to produce them but adults do emerge every year. Now within the periodical cicadas, there are two life cycles. There's a 17 year life cycle and a 13 year life cycle. We have three species that are synchronized at their emergence and that are emerging this year with root 10. If you look at it from the top, one large, two small, you flip them over and it's a, you look at the underside that you really see the differences. Imagine cicada septum decim, but a lot of orange on the underside. Magis cicada castani is entirely black on the underside, and Magis cicada septendecula, very narrow orange bands. Sometimes you get these two, you know, you're not sure which of the two you're looking at. The way to tell is to look at the eye and the base of the wing, and there's this orange patch that is only found on the decim species, septendecim. Also in this picture, this is a female, her abdomen is more pointed at the end because of the existence of her ovipositor, the males are more blunt. So you can now sex the species and tell them apart. Now we also have three species of 13 year cicadas here in Ohio. It's one of the things that my lab discovered back in 2001. <clears throat> there are four species of 13 year, uh, spe uh, of 13 year cicadas. Only the three on the, uh, on the right here are found here in Ohio. The Neotridesum, is only found out west in Illinois and Kentucky and those areas. But we have a large and two small, if of the three that we have, just like we saw with the 17 year forms. Uh, Tridesum has a lot more orange than we see on the underside of, of Septendesum. Uh, we have uh, uh, the sound, the call is very similar, but at a different pitch. 
Here is Tredecasini, also like its counterpart, the 17 year form, all black on the inner side. And here is Tredecula, very narrow orange bands without the orange between the eye and the base of the wing. This form here, which is called Neotredesum, was discovered just a, about 21 years ago. And it's very interesting. You'll notice that the color pattern here, excuse me, the color pattern here is very similar to the color pattern here. And that is because when we look at the mitochondrial DNA, they are nearly identical. Indeed, this evolved from a septendecim ancestor. And so that's quite of an interesting process involved. The uh, evolution, every relationships of the cicadas is something that we just has been worked out recently in the last five, six years. Cicadas as a group go back to the Mesozoic. Uh, my colleague, George Pernar uh, at Oregon State University and I described a few years ago, described a 110 million year old cicada nymph that crawled out of a tree in what is now Myanmar and fell into some sap and was entombed in, in uh, Burmese amber. Uh, I take a lot of uh, satisfaction at knowing that during the late Cretaceous, when the ancestor of the T-Rexes were walking around in Asia, that cicadas were screaming in the trees. And I, I, I really took a lot of satisfaction when I visited Kosai in Columbus a, a few months ago before the, uh, the pandemic and found in their late Cretaceous diorama, they put cicada shells. So like, you know, I, I finally made it, you know, that was like the thing that, ah, I had a contribution that changed the diorama. That was kind of neat. So that tells us that the, the cicadae were present back in the Mesozoic. The ancestor of the periodical cicadas, uh, which belonged to the genus Magiscata, the Magiscata common ancestor lived in the Pliocene uh, about 3.9 million years ago. And that's when it split into one large and one small species. 1.4 million years later, or two and a half million years ago, that small species split into two, the Cassini group and the Decula group. Meanwhile, over with the large form of half a million years ago, the large species separated into Tridesum and Septendesum, and then all the broods and the remaining species evolved in the last 300,000 years. Uh, that's where I'm drawing the line here. Uh, and, and what that tells us is that that the 17 year life cycle evolved independently several times. The broods themselves evolved in many cases during the last ice age. In fact, here in greater Cincinnati, as you know, uh, uh, the ice sheet was about uh, uh, 25 miles north of where I'm sitting right here in the west side of Cincinnati, about 20,000 years ago. There were no cicadas here. There was no forest. It wasn't until the glaciers, uh, the last glaciation started to retreat but 6,000 years later, the glacier, the ice age, uh, the ice sheet was north of what's now Toledo. As it moved north, the forest came with it, and with the forest came the cicadas. And so a lot of our understanding now of how, how the broods evolved, their relationships to one another, and so on, <clears throat> excuse me, is related to the uh, uh, our understanding of the great ice ages, uh, the four ice ages, and uh, the distribution of the glaciers and what have you. <coughs> Pardon me. So that's our evolutionary history. This year we're talking about brood 10. And I do get a lot of comments about brood X. Yes, brood X is sexier, but it's actually brood 10. This is a, a convention that started back in the, in the last 10 years of the 19th century when Charles Marlott, in order to make some sense of all the different categories that we ascribe to the periodical cicadas, he proposed in 1893 that all 17 year cicadas that emerged in 1893 were to call that brood one. If they moved, emerged in 1894, that's brood two. And that numbers one through 17 were reserved for 17 year cicada broods. <clears throat> if you're a 13 year cicada and you emerged in 1893, then you belong to brood 18 and numbers 18 through 30 are reserved, reserved for 13 year cicadas. And so by just saying brood 10, you immediately know you're talking about a 17 year cicada brood. And once we did that, once that happened, the patterns that emerged when we looked at the individual broods started to make sense, started to come, uh, come through in uh, our understanding. 
So here's where the periodical skaters exist today. The blue dots are 17 year skaters. The red are 13 year cicadas. You'll notice that the red dots are generally south of where the great ice sheets were during the last glaciation advance. The 13 year, the 17 year forms are north of, include areas north of where the glacier uh, existed at one time. And it's thought by many that the 13 year or very long life cycle evolved as a way to cope with unpredictable weather patterns uh, of what happened during the Pleistocene glaciation. And it looks like there might be a single genetic switch that triggers an additional four years in their life cycle. And if that's the case, and you're living at the edge of the glacier or nearby, but conditions are really cold and unpredictable, it might be worthwhile to wait it out another four more years, let it continue retreating. And that may have been part of the selection pressures for the evolution of the longer life cycle, those populations living close to the, the glacial edge. So when we look at the uh, broods, we did all this pattern in these numbers. It turns out there are now recognized 15 different broods of periodical skaters, 12 17 year broods and three 13 year broods. And what you see here are nine of the nine of the uh, uh, 12 uh, 17 year broods. This is brood one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Our Ohio broods occur, uh, in, in, include brood five that we see in the eastern half of the states that emerged back in 2016. We've also got brood eight, which emerged two years ago in extreme uh, northeastern Ohio. The other broods that we see here do not come into Ohio at all. Uh, we have the three additional 17 year broods, brood 10, that's what we're seeing this year. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we have brood 13, there's no 11, no 12. And brood 14, there's no 15, 16, or 17. So 12 out of every 17 years, you're going to have a 17 year skater brood somewhere in the eastern half of the US. There are three broods of 13 year skaters, is all. Brood 19, which is the largest of all the periodical skater broods, whereas brood 10 is the largest of all the 17-year uh, uh, skater broods. Brood 22, and this is one that's very near to my heart because it includes our only 13-year brood and something that my lab discovered back in 2001 and verified by 2014. And then brood 23, which is the great uh, Ohio River, Mississippi River Valley brood. <clears throat> And here is, here it is, your periodical SCADA decoder ring. Uh, starting in this very top row with 1634, that's the first historical record that we made when the Westerners first reported periodical cicadas. It occurred in Plymouth Colony, uh, and uh, uh, it uh, was described by William Bradford, the second governor of Plymouth Colony. Since then, we have been able to document cicadas for all the broods, but not necessarily as far back. Our oldest uh, brood 10 brood here is 1715. And that's when the, uh, the uh, brood 10 was first reported in um, Philadelphia at the uh, uh, Gloria Day uh, Swedish Lutheran Church by Reverend Andreas Sandel. And that's our first reference uh, to brood, what became known eventually as brood 10. And I'm hopeful that somebody in this, in the uh, Philadelphia area will take my app, Cicada Safari, and go down to, the church still stands. Go to the church. It, are the cicadas still there? Because that is the periodical cicada brood 10 mothership. That's where they were first reported. I'm curious to see if they're still present or not. Uh, so, so that's the background to what, what cicadas are, their broods, the species, and so on. What are the signs of periodical cicadas? Well, the first sign we've already seen, and that's the appearance of these chimneys. These are mud extensions of their tunnels that occur usually in mid to late April. You might remember about four weeks ago, we had a rain on, on Saturday that just didn't, it was just a misty rain all day long. And sure enough, all over town, uh, the cicadas extended their tunnel. In this particular case, this one's from 2004, and it's about three inches in, uh, in, in height. The largest ever uh, described is about uh, 10 to 12 inches, somewhere in there. And uh, these are some of the early ones where you see they extended well above the soil uh, for uh, them to get out of the, uh, the seeping water. And what's actually going on here is that water starts to drain into their holes or tunnels. And as they detect that, 
they, they, their, their instinct is to extend the tunnel. And that would be, you can't have them dig down further because they'll be in the water because it's collecting at the base of the, of the tunnel. But so they extend it upward. And then after a few hours, a few day, a day or so, <coughs> excuse me, the cicada, the water drains out, uh, so eventually percolates out of the, uh, the tunnel and the cicadas go back down. They'll form a new cap further down, but the chimney uh, uh, is retained. Indeed, I saw some chimneys today that are over a month old. The, uh, if you are to dig up cicadas in your yard, uh, uh, here's what a periodical cicada looks like that's 12 years old. Notice that the eye is all white. One of the signs that cicadas are gonna emerge in the next year is what happens in the 16th year. That's when the eyes turn red. So if you are digging up cicadas here on the west side in, our, in your garden this spring, you saw red-eyed cicadas, they're coming up this year. If you're out in Batavia, Mostly you got white-eyed cicadas because they're 14 years old. Uh, excuse me, they're 13 years old and they'll be coming out in four years and their eyes have not turned red. Then just before they emerge, they develop these black patches behind the head on the, on the pronotum. And that's actually part of the process of uh, that they, the, the adult inside the uh, nymphal skin has now separated from its old cuticle and is uh, slowly going to be coming out in the next probably day or so and then uh, emerging into an adult. What causes that, of course, is the soil temperature. It reaches 64 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, in many cases, right for a nice soaking, right? not a drenchal downpour that uh, uh, would be a once in a century storm, just a nice soaking rain, 64 degree temperatures, and these things start to pop. And here's a photograph I took in 2004 of one that just had just broken forth out of the soil. It's just seeing light for the first time. I was there with a film crew from Japan and they were anxious, anxious to see the cicadas come out of the, out of the ground. So they set this big ring of lights and we watched and watched, nothing was happening. So I got a little tired and I walked out of the circle and looked down at my feet and all behind the lights were these cicadas popping out of the ground because the light was driving them back in. So all we had to do is turn the lights around and, and there you see it, a cicada popping out of the, uh, out of the ground. They come out of holes that are about the size and diameter of our pinky. And uh, uh, this is one of the densest areas that uh, I measured. This particular area was in Delhi and it was 356 emergence holes per square yard. That's a lot of bugs. And these are pretty good sized bugs. Uh, so it was that, and in fact, that little area of the cemetery that I was measuring this in, uh, probably it produced 230,000 uh, cicadas after I looked at the amount of area that was going on at that rate, that was involved with that rate. These insets are plaster of Paris molds I made in the tunnels. I, uh, after I knew the cicadas were done, I poured plaster of Paris down the tunnels, let it harden, and excavated it like an archaeological dig to see what did their tunnels look like. And these are this first one in the far left is about six inches down. This is eight, this is eight. And this one's really kind of intriguing. It's got a little turnaround spot where the skate can walk head first back in and then walk head first out. So it's really quite a quite an uh, interesting uh, uh, tunnel arrangement, if you will. Uh, and they come, they start coming. They come in big numbers. They climb up a ventral surface. As they climb up the ventral surface, they lock their tarsal legs into a, a tree trunk, a fence, a post, a brick wall, whatever. They start the process of transforming to an adult. First thing that you see is the nymphal skin splits across the thorax. This area here, you see the, the creamy white adult inside. That head capsule here is now split into the uh, uh, forward, far enough into the this pronotum here, and then eventually into the head capsule itself. It slowly wriggles its body out of the nymphal skin, slowly pulling it out, eventually ending almost upside down, held in place by just the tension of that opening of the nymphal skin. These white filaments that you see, those are the tracheal tubes that were part of the nymph. They're inside the adult. So when the adult leaves, they've got to be pulled out of the adult so it can breathe properly. As the uh, Nymph hangs upside down and hangs upside down for about, about uh, 20 minutes, in part so that the tarsal claws can harden, so it can grab hold of, the, of, its, of its skin. Uh, it does a sit-up, 
grabbing hold of the head capsule of his old nymphal skin, and then slowly works its abdomen out of the skin. And there we have it, a adult now free from its nymphal confines, an adult cicada, but it doesn't look quite right. Its wings haven't expanded. So what it needs to do first is pump fluid through its wing veins, which it does is it expands its wings, eventually expanding to the point that they look like a typical cicada, except they're still white. Now, the process from this thing just popped out of the ground to this point is about an hour and a half. And tonight, walk outside and check your own trees in your neighborhood because you may have this going on right now in your backyard. It's happening all over Cincinnati. It takes another hour and a half for the cicada to darken its exoskeleton and have it, and have it appear like the uh, uh, typical adult cicada that we've uh, come to recognize with its red eyes, black body, orange veined wings and orange legs. Now it's not ready to start its cicada behavior yet. What's gonna happen next is these uh, cicadas are gonna move up. They're gonna climb higher into the tops of trees where they're gonna sit for the next five days. One of the weird things is that after they emerge, it's eerily quiet for days. And what's going on is that the cicadas are on the tops of the trees. They're still hardening their exoskeleton and they're maturing their reproductive uh, organs for the mating process that takes five days. So after five days, you'll start hearing one or two isolated calls. That's because they all don't come out at one night. You might have a, a half a dozen or so in your yard come out one night and then 50 the next night and then several hundred the next night, depending on temperature conditions. And those first ones that come out will be singing all by themselves in five days. After six days, you'll be more. So you'll have uh, overlapping calls after six days uh, constant calling and chorusing on after seven days, and the, those that just get louder and louder as we continue our our uh, time since the first ones emerged in your in your yard. <clears throat> if you miss it, you go out the next morning, and the whole place is surrounded by these ghostly reminders of what emerged from the ground, the immature skin. Now, these skins have a lot of interesting information. They can be sexed. They can be taken to species. So you can actually go out and collect these skins and still get a lot of data. And uh, uh, by doing this, if you go out and start collecting the skins the first day they come out, it turns out about 70% of the first cicadas come out are male. By day five, it's about 50-50. And by the time we get to about day 10, more females are coming out than males. It turns out males can mate up to three times. Females generally mate only once. Uh, so uh, that, that you can see the benefit of having the males come out and be essentially give their lives. So the cicadas may live. This great altruistic uh, 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 action, if you will. But they keep coming. 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 And they really start to scream at this point when there's lots of them at the, out there and they're, they're gathering in chorusing centers. Chorusing centers that are... Uh, the, that. Uh, uh, are necessary for attracting a female. Uh, the male sings with timbals that you see right here behind the, uh, under the wings, the first abdominal segment. Uh, they are, you'll see it's sort of white. That, that's the same color white that the uh, adult was before it hardened. And there are dark lines here, which are ribs that are made of chitin. And there's muscles on the inside that when contract cause these ribs to buckle. And if you could buckle those and relax, buckle and relax them like 200 times a second, then you'll have a call. You'll have the call of the cicada and the male abdomen is mostly a, a hollow. So it serves as a resonating chamber. And that's how the, the uh, a cicada makes his call. If you'd like to illustrate that, what you can do is take a, a bendy straw and pull it out, push it back in several times. And you'll hear that, zzz, 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 that that's how the calls are made. The females do not have timbles. Instead, they respond to the male's calls by, by uh, flicking their wings at the right point. The typical mating call of septum decim, for example, uh, sounds like some people describe it as the word pharaoh. I'll whistle it to you. It's all like a. And at the point, at a one point in that call, the female flicker wings. So I'll clap for that. If the male hears her, he'll turn and face her. He'll walk a little closer and he'll sing. Okay, guys, 
please do not try this at bars. Uh, it is not a, a workable solution for feeding people. Sometimes a second male starts trying to call a female uh, when he when he uh, when he hears that female respond to a first male, he'll start calling before the first male gets that before that note drops. He'll start calling to confuse her, so she in turn flicks her wings to the second male. There's this competition now uh, for uh, potential mates. Uh, if if that that hasn't happened and the first male walks close to the female. He'll go to a second call, which is. He will then walk, up, continue walking towards her, tapping her on his, on her on her thorax with his heart, his leg. He'll start the copulatory process, and mating ensues. And here is a, a, a pair of, of cicadas and copula. Mating lasts several can last several minutes to hours, in fact. Uh, the male is transferring his sperm in these large sperm ropes, ropes where the, the heads, the acrosomes are all fused and the, uh, the flagella are off to the side and they move from the male into the female, into her spermatheca, which is a structure inside the, that many insects have, uh, females have that stores and nurtures sperm. Uh, so that's uh, the process involved with that. Uh, after she has uh, uh, been inseminated and the male has, uh, uh, exhausted his supply of sperm, he dies. Meanwhile, the female, now having been inseminated, has to start the process of laying her eggs. And she does this by puncturing the terminal end of a tree branch with her ovipositor. You can see the ovipositor here actually being inserted into the, the branch. So this here is about the thickness of a pencil. Here's what the ovipositor looks like. You'll notice at this end, it's ribbed. It's actually serrated. And some of the research that I just published about a little over 18 months ago, we looked at the chemical composition of the serrated edges of the ovipositors, and they're reinforced with metal. Zinc and manganese are two of the metals, and that allows them to literally saw into the tree branch uh, in order to puncture the tree branch and then allow the female to lay the eggs. Down the middle here on the far right, lower right, the ovipositor is inserted here, and she's laying an egg here. There's another egg over here, an egg here, and an egg here on each side of where the ovipositor has been inserted. She has a total of about a little over 500 eggs, and uh, she will keep doing this, laying 10 to 20, uh, sometimes even up to 30 or 40, in some, some cases, uh, in a single egg nest. Uh, they're usually about a quarter inch long. And then she'll remove her ovipositor, walk a quarter of an inch, and do that again. She'll keep doing that until either she runs out of a branch, in which she, fly, in case she flies a new branch, or she runs out of eggs, and then she dies. Not in that instantaneous, but within a day or two. And here's what the egg nests look like. Uh, she will have inserted an ovipositor right here. It will go down in here, and then she'll lay the eggs on each side of where the ovipositor is inserted. As she pulls it out, the eggs are laid. That she walks a quarter of an inch down and does it again, laying the eggs, pulls out, punctures the tree branch, and continues doing that until she lays all of her eggs. And as you can see here, this really can tear up the vascular tissue of that uh, of that branch, and sometimes it tears up to the point where it can cause the the leaves to turn brown and wither, and we call that flagging. And they'll even break at that point and sort of the dangle there, these, these sort of uh, uh, brown dried out leaves. And uh, this is how some cicadas can indeed damage the, uh, the tree. It has to do with this uh, tearing up the vascular tissue, uh, which dries out the water and the leaves, they turn brown. And uh, that's the unsightly uh, appearance. If you have a new sapling, that's probably three or four feet or shorter in height with very few branches, it's quite possible that cicadas could try to lay eggs in what little few branches that it has, and that would kill probably a sapling. But for a mature tree like these oaks that you're seeing here uh, with the brown flagging, it's not gonna cause much of a problem at all. In fact, in 1869, a paper published in American Entomologist titled, Out of Evil Cometh Good. And it was a, a observation by orchardists in Illinois and Missouri that they were having a bumper crop 
on their fruit trees that year. And they attributed it to the egg laying of the cicadas, which is like a natural pruning resulting in a greater flower set the following year. And so uh, uh, for a mature tree, it can be quite beneficial. Uh, here's a photograph from my house where I lived in 2004. On the left, you see a, it's a crabapple tree and, and uh, literally thousands of cicadas flew in. Not a single cicada emerged under this tree because it was an area that had been clear cut, trees removed and uh, then replanted in the mid nineties. Uh, cicadas did emerge about a half a mile one direction and three quarters of a mile another direction. So they all flew into this area and boy was the oval position damage extensive. And what you see on the right is the appearance of my crab apple tree the next year uh, when that uh, natural pruning took place. It, it's just an incredible mass of flowers uh, that occurred from that, uh, uh, from that egg laying damage. So th that in the, um, in the uh, uh, long term, it's quite beneficial for the next year, not the year of the emergence. Question, do you have cicadas in your own backyard right now? If they haven't emerged, you can find this out. Uh, these egg nests will heal. Here's a one-year-old egg nest that's beginning the healing process. And if you know your branch morphology, you can find the annual growth scars and go back 17 and find that they will find healed periodical cicada egg nests. And so if you find these in your, in your branches, these branches, so this is from a maple, that's about a, the diameter of a quarter. So you can go, if you, can't, if you don't know how to do the count or, or haven't, can't, don't care, carefully see the, the annual growth scars, you can go back to where it's about a, a quarter in diameter and see if you can see any of these healed scars. If you can, then you'll, you'll have cicadas emerging under that spot where that uh, overhangs. So after the egg laying is done, they die. The carcasses, the bodies accumulate at the base of, your, of trees and they get wet with morning rain and they then he, uh, start to the decay with the under bacterial action as it uh, continues to get warmer and warmer and warmer. And boy, can they stink at this point. And uh, it's at this time that what's going on is the decay is allowing the nutrients from all these dead cicadas to go back in the soil. And here's where we talk about that fundamental question that I've always asked, well, what good are cicadas? Well, during the 16 years that the cicadas are underground, they're turning over soil like earthworms. That's beneficial. When they come out of those holes in the ground, that's like a natural aeration that helps uh, the soil and helps rain get to the roots. When they come out in big numbers, they, uh, uh, they are a food pulse for all sorts of predators, raccoons, squirrels, birds, rodents, uh, all feed on these things. And that can help uh, build up populations if they've been recently in decline. Uh, when the female lays her eggs, it's like a natural pruning, which uh, uh, results in a greater fruit, fruit set the next year. And lastly, as their bodies decay, they accumulate the base of trees, rot, and those nutrients go back into the soil to help the tree where their eggs have been laid. So there's a lot of things that are positive about a periodical cicada. If we, could, if we killed every cicada out uh, in our forest, we still have forests, no question about that. But when they do come out, they perform this opportunistic pulse of food, pruning, improved uh, uh, nutrition for the trees after a while that, uh, that, that is beneficial for the Eastern deciduous forest. So the eggs will all be laid by the end of June and the cicadas will be dead by then. What happens next? Well, the, the eggs will hatch. They'll hatch six to 10 weeks later, starting probably in, in uh, as early as mid July, more likely in early August and through the middle of August. And you can go out there and take a look at old egg nests and dissect out the eggs and see which ones have hatched. Here's a hatched cicada egg. Here's one that didn't hatch. And you can look at things like the mortality of uh, the egg hatch rate, different species of trees, that kind of things. It turns out there's no one species that's optimal. They lay their eggs in over 250 species of woody plants. So uh, it's, uh, uh, they, they seem to be again, opportunistic in where they uh, uh, want to lay their eggs. And the nymphs, uh, after they hatch, they literally crawl out of the egg nest, drop to the ground, landing on, on, on uh, a blade of grass if it's in your yard, and they immediately run down that blast grass blade and get underground as soon as possible because they're extremely vulnerable to spiders, ants, and beetles at this time. 
They'll feed on grassroots for a few weeks. And by New Year's Day, on July, January the 1st, 2022, they'll be 8 to 12 inches below the ground, sucking on a tree root. And that's where they're going to be for the next 17 years. What a life. No in-laws. No bills. No problems. Just down there nice and cool. All the tree sap you can suck out of that root. No bills, huh? <laughs> Speaking of bills. Yes, Peter. Bill, Bill Messer. I'm sorry. Bill, sorry. Oh, no, I just. I do want to tell you. Uh, I'll be near the end, I and I thought you, I. I got your joke about the bar, but we were all on mute. So if we laughed, you didn't hear us. Oh, it's okay. I've got a few <laughs> more things to finish up. Okay, and, I'm sorry. And, and that's all right. So. What's next is uh, what we're doing. What I'm, my whole research, why I'm interested in telling everybody about this, is uh, getting ready for. Is my cursor here? We are so getting ready for Brood Ten, and this is the distribution of Brood Ten based on the maps that we had in the past. And one of the reasons I'm really concerned about Brood Brood Ten is probably the most uh, famous of the broods because it occurs in a number of urban areas. It emerges in Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, and Cincinnati for the major cities west of New York in the 19th century. And everything we seem to know and the fundamental nature about Brood 10 comes from Brood 10 emergences. For example, in uh, 1749, it was Pericolm, uh, a, a protege of Linnaeus, who visits Philadelphia during the Brood 10 emergence. And he, in turn, collects cicadas and takes them back to Sweden for Linnaeus to name. And it was Linnaeus who named Cicada septendecim, the first species of periodical cicada for that reason. That's a brood 10, uh, brood 10 occurrence. And so uh, because of the large populations we had in these major cities, that's why there were scientists living there. They wrote things down. Much of what we know about periodical cicadas is the result of brood 10. So, one of the things I'm most concerned about this year and was brought up initially in the 1890s by the USDA is what's the future for brood 10? Uh, this is the map from 2004 from my research uh, in, in, in Indiana and Ohio. And you'll notice that the large circles are counties where you have large populations of, of brood 10 cases where you can drive for mile and mile and mile and still hear them singing. Small dark circles are areas where the, where the cicadas are widely dispersed. They're not they're patchy in their distribution. Open circles are areas where the cicadas have not been reported now since uh, 1987 or 1970. And uh, you'll notice a couple of things going on here. In Indiana, the northern half of the state, the cicadas are, in ver are very patchy. They used to be quite uh, common throughout the state of Indiana in 1885. In Northwest Ohio, over half of the counties are now devoid of cicadas. And so this concern was brought up by the USDA in 1898, worried that continued clear cutting of forest land for agriculture was going to mean the possible extinction of brood 10. They even said that again in 1919, I'm quoting from my book here uh, on page 84. Uh, this is the headline in 1919, 17 year locusts, that's what they called cicadas in 1918 is slowly going to be extinct in time. And they're talking about brood 10. So what I'm quite anxious to figure out is what is the true status of brood 10? Are they really dwindling? Now, as crazy as it sounds about periodical cicadas disappearing, it's happened. In 1954, brood 11 went extinct. Brood 11 was a common uh, and a major uh, cicada back in 16, 99 and 1716. Uh, it's on the outskirts of, it was on, it exists on the outskirts of Boston up in Massachusetts. And since 1634, uh, 1633, excuse me, it uh, has since, uh, there's been so much uh, removal of the forest land, increased urbanization and what have you has resulted in the, in the gradual decline and extinction of Brood 11 uh, in, uh, in 1954. And well, how it works is, as everything you can do that cuts through a forest, like putting in a road, putting in a condo development, cutting through to put in high intensity power lines, putting up windmills, anything that cuts into that forest is destruction of brood of cicada habitat. And we are seeing a significant decline here in 
the distribution of Brew 10. So this year I'm asking everybody to get my new app. Uh, it's Cicada Safari, it was designed by, I, I, is my design. Uh, and I worked with the Center for IT Engagement at Mount St. Joseph University to implement this thing. It's free, so the price is right. We do not care what you buy at Amazon. We don't care what you're searching on the Google, but we just want your help in mapping out where Brew 10 cicadas are. What you do is download the app, and then you go on your own cicada safari. And if you see a cicada, you photograph it and submit it to us. Every photograph that we receive is verified that it's a periodical cicada. So we got a verification for this process. It's a, a, essentially a crowdsourcing app that lets us verify that indeed periodical cicadas are present at Brew 10 in a particular location. And uh, to, I, I'm tickled like all I get out to tell you that as of last night, we now have 160,000 downloads and we have now been sent a quarter of a million photographs of Brew 10 cicadas. We are getting 30,000 photos a day. So we are going to have one of the probably the most detailed records of where Brood 10 is occurring ever done in the history of cicada distribution studies. So I hope you'll join me uh, in, in by getting this free app. Go out with your kids, your grandkids, go on a cicada safari and get them excited about natural history. Get them excited about science. Help us map out Brood 10. If you'd like more information uh, about my talk this evening, uh, my book, Periodical Skaters, the Brood 10 edition, was published on March the 1st by the Ohio Biological Survey. It's available from Amazon. It's also available at Joseph Beth's here in Cincinnati. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I'd like you to, to join me and my colleagues at the Center for IT Engagement, the University of Connecticut, the Ohio Biological Survey, cicadamania.com, the Indiana Academy of Science, the University of Maryland. I didn't have time to get their logos, but the University of Tennessee, the University of Kentucky, and my colleagues all over the eastern half of the U.S. that are helping map out Brood 10 of the periodical cicadas with Cicada Safari. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> if you you wouldn't have 250 million if I hadn't took one yesterday. So I just pushed you up there. I think. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I, <laughs> I do appreciate, I appreciate it. Happy, I'm sorry. So, I, I took my five-year-old out. We had a lot of fun. Excellent. Yeah, it's a, it is a, uh, it's the kind of thing I tell, I tell people who are afraid of cicadas to get involved, face your fears, go out there. And like right now, I'm going to seize the second. That's why I'm doing this. After the sun goes down about 11 o'clock, they start coming out of the ground. It is just fantastic. There we go. Dan's got a got it, and uh, uh, we have a leaderboard to engage people. We've got some. Our leader right now has submitted three thousand photographs already since she they started emerging in her neck of the woods in uh, in wow. southern Pennsylvania. Wow! But it's uh, I mean, you know, I was hoping hoping that we'd get about fifty thousand photographs. I never dreamed that we'd get a quarter of a million. Uh, and we're looking at every one of them. And even though we still, the, you know, we look, we saw we're, our backlog right now is 74,000 photos, but look at it the other way around. We've already examined 170,000 photographs. I find that just an amazing feat in itself. And uh, you tell, as uh, the emergence goes on, the number of photos will start dropping off and we'll finally catch up at the end. Am I correct in understanding that when you take the picture, <clears throat> uh, date and location and time are recorded, right? As well as correct. the photo. You cannot submit a photo without the metadata turned on. So we have date, time, longitude, and latitude. And then as soon as the photo is approved, it goes on our live map. And you can go on the map, the Eastern United States, go in and if you want to know where to look for cases, you don't have them, you want to find them, go to our map on the bottom of the app page. And uh, Dan has got that on his, on his app. Right next at the very bottom of the middle is the thing you press to take the picture. Just next to it says map. Touch that and it gives you a map of the Eastern US, and it'll focus wherever you're located. Good. And you told Cincinnati, and it'll then give you a little number where, as you zoom in, it'll eventually show you the actual street where those cicadas were. Wow. You mentioned about three or four uh, URLs and links. If you can put those in chat, I will publish them with the report on our. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Because I got you a picture of your book. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll publish that. I'll tell uh, 
I'll tell everybody that we write to, I think maybe 80 or 150 or something like that, people, and get those links to me here in chat or. Here's the uh, first one. Good, good, good. And cicadasafari.org. Uh, we'll link you to the app if you don't have it. It's available at the iPhone, uh, I, uh, at the App Store from Apple, and it's also available, available on Google Play for the droids. Uh, cicadasafari.org has is the website that supports the app. In addition to just general information about cicadas, which you'll also find on the app itself, uh, we have activities. Uh, you can learn how to fold an origami cicada. There's a cicada your, your kids and grandkids can uh, color. There are activities about how kids can interview their grandparents about what cicada uh, emerges as they remember and what years those would be. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of neat things like that that they can do. Uh, for schools, I had so many teachers contacting me that I created the Cicada Safari Research Station, which is a, uh, a series of six projects that schools can do uh, to send me the data on like what was the temperature of the soil the first day of the big emergence, uh, collect all the skins from the first five days. And even if you miss some of that, you can still do things like this. You can go out and collect 50 adults at random and it'll show you how to sex the, how to, how to identify the three species and find out what's the species diversity in your area. Wow. Uh, you can also measure how loud the calls are, maybe a free decibel meter for your iPhone or your droid and see how loud they're calling. A lot of neat stuff like that. And we've got schools now in Ohio and in uh, uh, Virginia and Maryland are all participating in this uh, free project. I was really surprised that the students at St. X High School in Cincinnati we're given the option of taking the final exam or doing the cicada research station projects. Guess, guess which one? one. Guess which <laughs> one. <laughs> There's an easy one. Yep. So well, here's a late arrival. Any other questions, folks? Bill, you're still the host, right? Bill? Uh, Bill, I'm asking him to unmute. Uh, Bill's unmute. Uh, Manny, uh, anybody have any questions? I'll... Yes, we have a question from Marty. Marty, how are you doing? Hey, Gene. Actually, my name's Bart. I'm on Marty's. Bart. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. That's okay. So, so, Gene, the question I have is that the females mate once, the males mate three can mate up to three times. Right. And indeed, most uh, 85, based on, on census studies, it's the 85% of the males only mate once, 10% mate twice. 5% of eight, three times. 5% are the real, they're the real goers. Um, Just like college. Yeah. The question I have is, does it always take, or do, does a female mate and nothing happens and she just, she, it, it, it doesn't hit? Well, it usually takes, however, a female could be interrupted from mating. Uh, and that might lead to additional matings. Uh, the, uh, the benefit of having the male take a mate more often uh, if he doesn't exhaust to all of his sperm supply is that if more males are eaten at the early in the emergence, there needs to be additional males towards the end. And that's what, that's what's happening. So I have a question. Um, I was in North Carolina for well on and off for the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was a brood there. Do you know what that you might had a brood? Been? Well, there was a brood that came out last year. That was uh, uh, what part of the state? Middle, west, uh, east? Uh, west, Asheville. Uh, uh, Western, uh, last year, Brew 9 emerged in extreme uh, northwestern North Carolina. And then four years ago, Brood 6 also occurred in western North Carolina. Okay, and, uh, I think it was probably that one. And then I wasn't had, there last year. We did have last year a little bit of uh, Brood 19 emerge off cycle. And Brood 19 uh, will occur, I think occurred last time, uh, Let's see, uh, we have here for brood 19 was our last, uh, our last go around for it. Here we are. The last time brood 19 emerged would have been in, uh, um, in 2011. And that would have been central, like the Durham Raleigh area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. Yes, Michelle. Um, I grew up in the New York City area. Mm -hmm. And I never heard of cicadas till I came to Ohio. But I see from your map that uh, there are cicadas in the New York area. So I'm just wondering about the differences in behavior. Well, why, how is it, you know, here they're like, they blanket everything. 
And in New York, I was able to live without even knowing they, they existed. Well, the, the maps the maps in New York are there because of the they were big in 1885, 1902, and 1919. They oh, have over the, year <laughs> the, the they have over the recent year right recent emergencies declined. I put the map, the map dots in it because I wanted people to go make sure if I, are they really gone from that area. We did have one adult be, be reported from Harlem this year, uh, and we've had some from South Amboy in New Jersey right across the the way from uh, New York City, uh, right. where they should be still hanging out is on Long Island. And uh, there have been That's reports- That's where I grew of, up. Okay, yeah. there are reports of cicada holes there, but no one has yet reported uh, adult cicadas. So they may be gone by now, but uh, they may, that's the reason they're rel they were relatively very light. But you also, had, you did have brood two cicadas and brood two occurred the last time there was eight years ago. Uh, okay. but, and uh, that's right, it's quite a phenomenon. They, they're right on the beach and they actually, you can see them fly out over the ocean and come back. That's real, that's the only wow. thing that occurs. So, oh, so, so that Jean, noise, okay. that noise that we hear from the cicadas, I thought I heard a noise like that in the summertime in the New York area. Are those yeah. just crickets? Is that, is that? They're, those are probably annual cicadas that came out later in the summer. Oh, okay. But didn't blanket the ground. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Certainly. Yeah, so Jean, um, in terms of annuals and, and periodical uh, cicadas, um, I'm usually in the south of France in the summers working mm -hmm. and the cicadas are there all the time. They call them seagulls and uh, people wear them in prints all over their clothing and they, they, uh, they celebrate them. They're really, they're, there's a pack of cigarettes, a brand of cigarettes called seagulls and stuff. Um, and we, we get all freaked out about them. And is it, is it primarily because we don't see them so much and it, it feels like uh, an invasion every 17 years and they're, they're just part of life and they're always there and they're part of the summer? They've always been there. And uh, given the, uh, the, I'm trying to remember the details, there are a lot of folklores in, France, in the Provence region about this. Uh, uh, allegedly, they were created to get, keep the peasants from falling asleep during the day. And that was what their singing was for. However, it turned out many of them found the singing so relaxing that they actually lay down and slept more when the cicadas were singing. And so the, those stories go back several centuries. But uh, uh, fortunately in Provence, they've actually embraced the cicadas. Uh, in addition to what you were describing, they sell all sorts of uh, pottery in the shape of little yeah. buttons. You can nail all the cicada, put a single uh, uh, cut flower in. Uh, they're, they're extremely popular. Uh, and they've turned that in almost into a, uh, almost like a, 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 la a motto, if you will, or a, or a mascot in Provence. Uh, there are parts of uh, areas of Western Indiana, West Lafayette tried to do that with the annual cicadas, and it just hasn't taken the same route. But I don't think West Lafayette, Indiana, and Provence in France have the same as je ne sais quoi. <laughs> <laughs> je ne sais pourquoi. I don't know yeah. why not. <laughs> So they call them seagulls in uh, France, huh? Seagulls. Seagulls. Seagulls, I think. Is, is... Yeah, I think that's, that's Spanish, yeah. So, so. I have a question. Yes, um, we, we, as you know, we have a, a ton of cicadas in our backyard, and I've been going out and checking them out every day. Um, I've been noticing uh, a number of them that have deformities and are probably not going to be able to fly like ever. Um, sometimes they'll like they'll they'll get their color and turn dark before their wings have expanded, and they're just permanently shriveled up. Is that normal for that to happen to a few of them? That is very normal, but and it's uh, it looks like it's a large number that you see because what happens? Uh, what you're correct. What happens is they as they're developing and they're pulling out of the shell they sometimes will fall out and that causes their wings to get distorted. And if they don't, if they can't crawl up a branch fast enough so the wings can fully expand, they will get shriveled up. Uh, and uh, in those cases, the, uh, the, the, on the other hand, those who do form the wings properly, like the one behind you in your, on your background, they're at the top of the trees, you don't see them. So you see an unrepresentative sample at the base of the trees. It makes it look the whole population is being destroyed. 
but they're yeah. quite beneficial. They're quite beneficial in that those will be the ones, some of the ones that a lot of the ground squirrels and the rodents will eat first as they satiate themselves. Okay. Uh, so they still serve a purpose. Even if they can't fly, uh, males can still sing in some cases and mate. Uh, uh, and the females, the, and the, for the female, she's never able to make a noise loud enough to flick her wings for a male to, to notice her. But uh, uh, that is quite possible. Uh -huh. They still do function. But that's uh, uh, today was a hot day, for example, and it was so hot that if they didn't get up the tree to a, a, a point, optimal time, and start pulling out before they started darkening, they would get trapped. And that does appear okay. to be somewhat uh, having a, a reasonable number of those like that is beneficial because it helps to satiate the predators faster. Yeah, wow, well, good, okay. Aren't, I'll, aren't I'll predators stop. always stop, hungry? Stop worrying about them. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Marty, Marty has okay. his hand up. Marty hey, has his hand up. Or, Ask your question. Why are cicadas so loud? They want you to hear them. <laughs> and they also want to attract <laughs> a, a friend. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so you know just like uh, people like music some people like uh, some cicadas like the music of other males uh than others the females can't sing they only can they only can flick their wings or, or clap if you will uh whereas the males they're out there doing their doing their best to to, to demonstrate what they've got is there any evidence that they use anything other than sound like is there a scent or is mm. there there, there, there is evidence that vision plays an important, important part. Uh, uh, a study a few years back found that uh, in Cassini in particular, that female that, that if you look at the successful mating pairs versus the size of the males in the population, that the larger males are more likely to be selected for mating than the smaller ones. So in cicadas, size matters. <laughs> Marty. I saw your, I saw your map. Uh, of where the brood uh, 10 is, and mm -hmm. it was in some different places. And I wondered, like, did it get from one place to the other by some migra migration or, or, or like what, what accounts for where they are? That's my, and then I have one follow-up question. It's a weird one, but like, I've heard about these funguses that are, that are infecting all the cicadas. Well, and yeah, so well, the, the, the fun, I did a, I did a stint on the CNN, uh, new day on friday which apparently uh shook up poor brianna and uh john pretty much <laughs> but uh, uh I'll, I'll first start talking about the map this map here if you compare this map that you look at where they are uh for example the uh the glacier stopped around here in pennsylvania in ohio it's down to around here and through the middle of indiana and so northern indiana northwest and and most of ohio in the west here that's all from migration since we're treated the glaciers. The uh, glacier in Pennsylvania stopped right around here. So this is right at the glacier edge about uh, 12, 15,000 years ago uh, uh, during the end of the last ice age. Uh, the others down here, uh, these are widely scattered. We're trying to get, get a sense of what's happening. And this may be related to the possibility of, of uh, I'll go back to the, the large, the full distribution map. Um, You'll see that this overlap right here, this may be uh, what's called life cycle switching. 17 years coming out for 13 or 13 coming out for 17 and then permanently switching. Uh, but uh, what's really making this difficult to follow is, you know, we have an idea what happened to the last ice, ice age advance, but there are three more before that. And that came into play that we don't really have a good handle on how that affected the uh, distribution. But if you look at the, the distribution of cicadas in Ohio, and compare that to the physiographic regions that we that the uh, the map that the uh, Ohio Biological Survey has published. The physiographic regions tend to follow not 100%, but loosely where the cicadas are. Brood five is in the east. Brood 14 is in the south central. Brood 10 is in the far west. Each one of these have different physiographic regions, and so that comes in that plays a little bit of a role as well. We're not entirely sure how that how that fits, but it apparently does. And the fungus. Oh man, this fungus. Uh, <laughs> I was co-authoring the paper that described this a couple of years ago. Uh, cicadas get a fungal disease called, it's the, by this fungus, Massospora. It, uh, Massospora contains a, 
a uh, amphetamine, uh, uh, cathinone, uh, which causes a behavioral change in the males. Males affected with the fungus, uh, it, it, it causes, among other things, their hind end, their, their how can I say this nicely? I'll use what they said on CNN. Both their junk and their butts fall off. And as that happens, it sends them into a hyper sex drive. Ooh. So you've got this male with no junk, no butt. His abdomen is full of fungus and he is horny as all get out. So what he's trying to do is mate with all the females. He can, he'll sing still. The females will try to, he'll try to mate with the female, but there's nothing there to mate with. Instead, he inoculates her with the fungus. What's really weird is that when he hears a male calling, he flicks his, the, the, the fungal infected cicada flicks his wings like he's a female to lure in the amorous male for mating. And when that mating is attempted, the amorous male is infected with the fungus. So uh, what, uh, so when you consider, this is terrible for the, the cicadas, but if you consider it from the cicadas point of view, what's what, <laughs> from the, this, not, I'm sorry, if you consider it from the fungus perspective, excuse me, it makes a lot of sense because the fungus is just trying to reproduce to a maximum. And so they're doing everything they can there that, that, that amphetamine has modified the behavior of the infected cicada to essentially aid in the spread of the fungus. Can we spot a zombie? cicada if we see yes. one yes you uh you uh you can easily see them the abdomen breaks off and uh it uh has a chalky mass you look at the end of it it's a big chalky plug that's in the back it's very easy to see you want and, pictures uh, of those two i'm sorry you want pictures of those two oh sure certainly and you'll see more and more as they get as the season as the the, the uh, emergence progresses because right now the inoculated ones the fungus is growing on the inside and you know it's waiting for more adults to come out so we're going to inoculate more only about five to ten percent of the adults are are infected with the fungus uh so now there the annual cicada has got a, a massive spore of fungus as well but they get a different species and instead of the amphetamine the mat the an annual cockroach uh, annual cicadas they have uh, the active ingredient of psilocybin which happens to be the uh, active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And I see, uh, uh, Bart, you seem to know about those. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, uh, uh, Peter, you have your hand, you have a question? Do cicadas carry any kind of- I was of... on mute there. Oh. Um, I'm sorry, oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, um, I was, who's up? Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. I just was wondering, um, do cicadas um, carry that fungus or carry any other type of um, disease or anything? And that can that be transferred to you if they touch you? Uh, no, we don't have any. There's no evidence that cicadas can spread uh, a disease to uh, humans. Uh, they don't sting. They don't bite. Uh, the fungus does not affect us at all. Uh, as I pointed out when on CNN on Friday, it doesn't affect humans. Our butts are not going to fall off. <laughs> so, so we are safe. We are safe. <laughs> well, what about eating them then? When if the people want to eat, uh, if you want to eat cicadas, and I no longer eat cicadas, uh, and that's because of well, they got me tenure. <laughs> <laughs> so they did their job. <laughs> they did their job. Uh, however, yeah. if you want to eat them, you want to get them all the tenoral when they're all white, uh, and you mm. also want to uh, uh, get. Uh, 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 pick out the females because they're filled with eggs. The males mostly hollow, and uh, uh, I can. Uh, if I'm not going to tell you about it, but if you want to, you can uh, go up and look up uh, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, his show. Uh, somehow I was featured on Jimmy Kimmel on uh, uh, Thursday. Was it Thursday night, Wednesday or Thursday night about cicadas? Uh, my visage was shown on his uh, on his opening monologue about the cicadas, and I'll let you look that up if you want to. Uh, to see about how that related to his views on uh, eating cicadas. What is the deal with the uh, primary number 17 and how does, is that to keep, uh, you know, other numbers from crossing into their path? There, uh, for what's widely was believed that that was an ideal way of keeping predators and parasites from evolving synchrony with the cicadas, that there's no intermediate steps that a predator or a parasite could, could get to, to uh, evolve synchrony with the cicadas. The downside of that is uh, was suggested, well, that was true. Why aren't more insects doing this? Mm -hmm. 
But I also think that that may not may be the wrong question because these appear to be, you know, as I said, the cicadas are insects of climate. And uh, uh, if indeed the 13 year life cycle was an adaptation to living at the edge of the ice sheet, then it's not necessarily that all insects have to do that because they weren't living at the edge of the ice sheet. That might've been the, the, the major thing. The other, the other reason now against the, uh, the, uh, the idea of, uh, of synchrony uh, or, 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 or stopping synchrony with predators and parasites is in recent year, years, two new periodical cicadas have been discovered, not in the United States, one in Fiji and one in India. The Fijian uh, species has a life cycle of eight years and the Indian periodical cicada is four years. And so that challenges the fundamental idea about the prime number. Got it. Randy. Yeah, um, thank you for um, addressing us this evening. I think it's uh, very interesting. Oh, thank uh, you. Speaking of climate, um, what impact is climate change having on their population? Uh, two areas in particular. Uh, one, they are emerging earlier in, because when they, they emerge from the ground with a soil to reach 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So they are emerging earlier in May than they did at the uh, beginning of the 20th century, almost uh, a week to two weeks earlier. Uh, since they, they grow by counting the fluid flow in trees, that's how they, they uh, mark the passage of time, I should say. And uh, uh, that's how they can tell a year passed when they're underground. We don't know how they remember what year it is. That's the big mystery. But um, if we should have a mild winter that allows for additional uh, uh, sap flows that the cicada might interpret as that two years past when only one has, that can trigger them to molt early in their first five years of life, which would trigger a four-year acceleration. And so uh, we have had in the last site cycle two, three, five, 10, 13, 14 and 17, seven of the 15 uh, broods of cicadas, we know for a fact had early spun off four year accelerations. And uh, uh, the cause of that, because this occurs over so over 20 plus states is continental. We don't know what, you know, is, 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 is the only, only fundamental thing that's common to all those areas is increasing temperatures. And so if they should uh, inadvertently count six years in the first five years instead of five, they might molt that extra time, which will trigger a four-year acceleration. And so that would be uh, the result of essentially milder winters and the impact of trees. They're, they're monitoring trees. So it's how the trees react to climate change is, uh, is, what's, a, uh, is what's the driving force here. So. Thank you. So, well, thank you all. It's been, uh, oh, we got one, Nina, got another question. question. Yeah. One more question. Um, so if, uh, if the cicadas, um, if the tree that they're uh, latched onto and feeding off of dies, do all the cicadas that were attached to that tree also die? Can it they depends. go off and find a different tree? They can't move more than a yard underground. So if there, if there is another route close by, they might find it. They really don't know where to look. Obviously, they're just sort of tunneling. Uh, let's say if yeah. that tree is cut down in the year 17, 16 or 17, they might survive because unless the roots are dug up, there could be enough fluid in there in that in that uh, in the root system to keep them going. But earlier in that, they'll they'll all die. Mm. There's a question from Adam. Yes, um, Gene, you were saying I, I'm just not sure I understood. Like they, so if the tree has a good year, basically skips a winter. That accelerates the cycle by four years? It's not so much it skips a winter. Uh, I'll give you a case point. This is some of my own research. Uh, in 2006, some of you may remember this, we had an extremely mild December and January, uh, the December of 2006, January 2007. Our high temperatures in those two months was 65 degrees. The trees actually budded and started to produce leaves in January. We had a hard freeze and in February, all those buds and, and beginning developing leaves fell off. Six weeks later in April, we had the beginning of true spring. The trees budded out again, leaves formed, the cycle continued out, we have a true spring. That year, the cicadas counted two years when there was only one because there's two fluid flows. In Eastern Cincinnati, hundreds of cicadas emerged a year early because that was their 17th year. In reality, it was just the 16th year. And so brood eight, uh, brood uh, 
2015, which is expected in 2008, many of them came out in 2007. Hmm. Now, the big mystery, as I said, is how do they remember what year it is? That's that's the one that, that that's the kicker right now. And uh, I'm involved with some experiments with my colleagues at the University of Kyoto uh, in Japan uh, to try to figure out what that trigger might be. But uh, I can't say much more about it. I have to kill you. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, Sue. Hey, I got a question. Um, we just recently moved to the west side, so I was, I was expecting a lot of cicadas. Two days ago, I saw one adult cicada. I went out today and I saw nothing. Are we going to get any or? Oh, we have we have large numbers on the west side. What part of west side do you live on? Montford Heights. Okay, you should have them there. Uh, what's the history of the trees in your yard? Pardon? How many trees do you have? How, how long ago were they planted? Well, we just moved here, so I don't know how long they were planted. Um, we have a lot of trees. But the house was built like 22 years ago, so they may have been small then. I don't know. Okay, that's possible. In many cases, you may not have a single cicada emerge in your yard. However, if you're surrounded by cicadas, they will fly in and lay eggs, and uh, you'll you have to enjoy them that way. And that'll help you guarantee having a uh, uh, an emergence in your yard in 2038. And that's been seen a lot, if, uh, especially in uh, in areas where. Uh, uh, the development has caused all the trees to be removed, let's say, and the infrastructure mm -hmm. put in, as I mentioned earlier, or uh, uh, people just didn't get around to planting them until after the year. A lot of people delay planting their trees until after the cicadas are done so the cicadas can't hurt them. But that means you have no cicadas under your, uh, coming up under your trees this year, but you'll have, they could fly in as long as they're a mile away or less. Okay. So you'll steal your neighbor's cicadas. <laughs> Dixie. Yeah, I have a question back to the fungus infected cicadas. I know dogs like to eat cicadas. Will the fungus infected ones hurt the dogs? It, there's no evidence that it does. Uh, it might get, make a little more hyper if that amphetamine affects them in that way. I'm not sure <laughs> if cathinone, whether that'll cause that kind of effect. And the dose is pretty small. That dose is going to be an LD50. So, but they need to eat a lot of infest, infected uh, uh, cicadas. And it's only about five. So if they, eat, if they eat 10, odds are one might be infected. So don't worry about it. Yeah. So. And often with with dogs, yeah, if they eat enough of them, they'll they may get sick anyways. Right. So they wouldn't really absorb that much because the the chitin does upset their digestive tract. So yeah. a lot of times they'll they'll get rid of them. So, yeah. I remember the dog I had in two thousand four. He thought they were like, the shells were like doggy popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how my dog now is going to do with them. With it remains to be seen. <laughs> Uh, Michelle has her hand up. Yes, I had a question about uh, when you were talking about a disruption in the number of years in a cycle. Like, mm -hmm. uh, so what happens after that? Do they revert back to the original cycle, or do they start from that point with uh, the number of years being counted from that point yeah. for the Michelle, next time? That's a great question. I have the the when that happened in the year two thousand, that's what we wondered would happen. The published prediction was that they would revert back. So, you know what we did? We waited 13 years. And 13 years later, tens of cicadas came out for 13 years, but everyone was eaten. Wow. It didn't come out in the numbers to, to overwhelm predators. Four years later, after 17 years, thousands came out. They overwhelmed predators, probably because they were also joined by other accelerating cicadas, but they reverted back to 17. And so the... The, and the reason why we thought that was to be the likely thing happening is that if you look at the distribution of the different broods, adjacent broods are tending to be four years apart. And the lagging brood, you know, brood 14 is older than 10, the lagging brood uh, tends to be lighter than the more recent ones. So here in Ohio, we've got brood 14, four years apart from 10, that's what's coming this year. And we had populations of brood six in 2017. Uh, so we got brood nine next to five, next to one. And so it, to account for that pattern would be a four-year acceleration, but then a shift back to 17 years. And so that's why we thought that'd be the case. And that is the case. Hmm. Interesting. Yes, Bill. Bill. So Gene, one of your areas of, of uh, investigation is insect mythology. 
So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit of cicada mythology. Well, there's a couple I can mention just in passing. Uh, uh, one uh, uh, here in North America, uh, Mahu, the uh, petroglyph of the flute player out in Southwest, uh, Southwest US, that's a cicada. Ah. And so uh, the, the uh, humpback flute, flute player, Mahu, M-A-A-H-U, that is a cicada. Uh, and uh, uh, that's kind of a, a neat little story about that one. That's one you can, you can enjoy. And you, think, you look at the, their cicadas, they got the big lump or, or heavy uh, pronotum, which is the humpback, and their proboscis mouthparts is the flute. And they, of course, sing, that's their call. Huh. But probably the most famous cicada myth out there, and I'll end with that this evening, is uh, in ancient Greece, when the muses uh, uh, appeared, they created music and it so inspired the men that they kept, couldn't stop making music. They wouldn't even eat, they wouldn't even eat. And so to save, the mu to save these men, the muses turned them into cicadas that could sing all day and never have to eat, so. Yeah. Okay, you, you uh, expressed that you uh, this want to wrap it up? Wonderful. Yep, so those are two of the cicada, uh, cicada stories. There's some uh, others from other cultures, but those are two of my favorites. So, so. well, you've all been uh, wonderful uh, this evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. you. And, thank uh, you so much for, you. for coming out and, and speaking to us here about the cicadas. We really enjoyed uh, learning about it and, and so glad that you were able to, to stop in and talk to us right as they're all hatching. So <laughs> it worked out well, timing. didn't it? Yes, so. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have, have a, good a, rest, have a okay. restful evening, Jean. I hope this is your last one, right? Uh, what, my last what? Emergence? Your last talk. You can, you can oh. now just chill. I am for the evening, yes. I've got another one on Thursday, and then uh, I've got a, that's, uh, I think I got like four or five more for the, uh, for the next two months. It was pretty yeah. hectic about, it was pretty hectic last month, uh, uh, our mo in early, uh, in, in the beginning of April, most of April and into early May, but that's how we got the word out for Sake Safari. That's why we've got mm -hmm. a quarter of a million. Uh, Wonderful. So. Great yeah. work, and thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Good night, everybody. <laughs>